our scripture today, uh, we're going to begin in the book of Genesis, chapter uh, 17, starting in verse 15. And here Moses writes, Then God said to Abraham, regarding Sarai, your wife, you, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? So Abraham said to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. Ishmael had already been born at this point. But God replied, no, Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac. And I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. As for Ishmael, I will bless him also just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of twelve princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. This is the word of God for the people of God. Uh, just go ahead to the end. It, it, it was a misprint in the sheet that I gave uh, Mindy. There we go. If you read your Bible from cover to cover, one of the themes that you will notice in it is that it seems that God has created not just humanity, but most of creation to be able in some way to bear fruit, meaning to be able to multiply itself, to, to, to take this gift of life that we've been given and, 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 and pass it on to another generation after us. And so... Fruitfulness, it seems, is something that, uh, because it's part of the, the design and the plan for humanity, it seems like it would be something that would bring us uh, a tremendous fulfillment when it occurs, doesn't it? On the flip side of that, whenever we are unable to bear fruit, when it becomes either problematic or uh, dangerous or something to that effect, it becomes a tremendous frustration, doesn't it? When I was a, a young boy, I always noticed that sometimes my mother would seem very sad, and I wouldn't know why until years later. When I was nine years old, uh, a few months into my, my ninth year, uh, suddenly that, that sadness that my mom sometimes would have changed, though, because she found out that she was pregnant with my little sister. And it turned out the great sadness that she had for those years was because there, were, there was a problem when I was born, and, and in order to correct it, they had to do some surgery on the spot, and they told my mother she'd never be able to have another child. And so, looking back, you can now, now see the great joy she felt and the blessing that she felt from God when suddenly, when, when she had no hope of having another child, suddenly God had blessed her and given her one. My dad, well... He was beside himself. My little sister had him wrapped around that right there. The jewel of his eye. But 
But I'm sure my parents aren't the only ones who have experienced the frustration of being told uh, that childbearing is not within their reach. And I'm sure that there are also those who have received a blessing uh, when they thought the impossible suddenly became possible. There is frustration in these moments. But does God give us up so that we no longer can bear any fruit whatsoever in our lives? I don't think so. Abraham was frustrated. God had made him a promise that he would be the father of of many nations. And Sarah was getting along in years, and she could not bear children. And so they had tried to manipulate the situation. Uh, Sarah had a servant girl uh, that uh, was was very beautiful, and so she uh, offered her servant girl to give birth to a child for Abraham so he would have an heir. And Ishmael, the one that we uh, see in our scripture named today, He was the result of that relationship. But God had told Abraham that he would be blessed through Sarah. When we have these moments where we know that God has has, has promised us something, but yet it never seems like that promise has come to us, it just doesn't seem like we see it on the horizon, what do we do? do? Do we give up? Do do we just think that God isn't going to fulfill this for us, that for whatever reason God has has cast us by the wayside and this promise that he's given isn't going to be fulfilled? Is that that what we know about who God is, that he just breaks his promises? You can kind of see where Abraham may have gotten a little depressed or upset or maybe even question God. He was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. I'm sure many of you probably understand the the issue there. They were beyond fruit-bearing years. And Ishmael himself, Abraham's only child, he was a product of that relationship that God had not necessarily asked them to do. And so you can see when Abraham's in this moment and he's bowing before God and God tells him that Sarah's going to have a child and he kind of laughs, but then he he, kind of redirects it a little bit, doesn't he? He says, bless Ishmael, my son, the one that I I have right here with me that I can see and touch and feel and hear. Bless him, Lord. And what is God's response? No, it's going to be Sarah's child that I do this with. So we do that, I think. When God has promised us something and we get tired of waiting for it or we think it becomes impossible, we kind of try to redirect what we think God's plan for our lives is. We try to re-understand God in a new way. We try to offer him something to work through that he has said, this is not how I'm planning to work through you. I have this promise for you. And God is saying to us, I believe, that when he gives us his promise, not only is he going to do it, but he's more than capable of pulling it off. So God corrected Abraham. And I think the reason that he did this, that he corrected him instead of really coming strongly out against Abraham's stubbornness, I think that as Abraham was bowing before God, God recognized, first of all, that Abraham was having a lot of trouble dealing with this that, and that Abraham's faith was still in God. It just, he couldn't, he couldn't get there. And times like this show up throughout throughout the entire Bible. And in a way, it's encouraging because it tells us that even in the moments 
when we can't fully comprehend what God is doing and in the moments when we make mistakes because we can't comprehend what God is doing, God still uses us and loves us. We make mistakes. Anybody, anybody here make mistakes? Yeah? I was going to say this would be a pretty empty place if we didn't make mistakes. So I think that God looked into Abraham and he saw uh, as Abraham was bowing before him and he had this tremendous confusion yet probably this, this great love for God. God saw something he could use there. He saw a potential. He just needed to, to, to kind of change its direction a little bit. And so this is the brokenness in this moment. And we find ourselves sometimes in this same brokenness, this confusion, this, this inability to, to, to really hold on to God's promises. It just has to do with our own limitations. But God is not out to destroy us, folks. He is out to bless us. He is out to fulfill his promises in our lives. And so he looks and he sees something of value that he can use when we are bowed down before him and we are willing to receive the love that he has for us and to see the miracles that he's going to pull off in our lives. I think also that this is a good time to also realize that it's possible for us to get to a point where when we de- when we're, when when it it's possible to get to a point where our hearts aren't able to be changed it's called the hardening of the heart and it's a condition that that comes up and it, it builds up over time um, the place that uh, I think we can see that highlights how it, how it kind of bears some relevance to what we're talking about today is actually in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, in chapter 11 in, uh, in Mark's Gospel, starting in verse 12, it says, now, now this is Jesus just after he had uh, uh, had his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It says the next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. And when they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. That evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, they passed by the fig tree he had cursed. The disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day, and he exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. fig tree, Jesus uses it to show the condition of the hearts of those who were in charge of the temple in that day. What had happened over the years, uh, because the, the law had forbidden those of the tribe of Levi from, from owning substantial property and they were supposed to depend upon the people of Israel to bring their tithes and offerings to the temple uh, and to be a part of the sacrifice uh, or partaking in the sacrifice, uh, that's how the priests were supposed to be looked after and they weren't supposed to have this, uh, 
concern about the inheritance that they would pass on to their children. Their children would be the ones who looked after the temple. But over the years, some greed had crept in. And so they had gotten, the, the priest had gotten control over things like uh, the sheep, and they had made rules that stated you could only use sheep that they had brought into that area to be used for sacrifices. And so people would have to come in and they'd bring money to, to buy these sheep or these doves. And so when they did, that money went into whose pocket? The priests, especially the chief priest. And, because, and there's another rule stating that the, um, the money that they used could not have the image of a human being on it or, 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 a, or a god or anything like that. And so the only coin they could use was from this place called Tyre, which was a city, and it, was, it had a sheaf of wheat on it. Uh, and the exchange rate that the money changers were giving was just tremendously, uh, it was uneven for the poor people that needed to change the money. And so they were making money off of that. And so you can see where God might would be upset if instead of this place where people were coming to bring the first fruits of their crops, the first fruits of their flocks, all of that so that they could share in joy with each other and with God's family and with God himself, instead they have to come in and, and go through this whole process which was uh, really stressful and, and cost a lot of money just so the chief priest could get rich. Their hearts had allowed them to bend the rules, and instead of being fruitful as God had called them to be fruitful, they had become corrupt. And so when Jesus looks to the fig tree on the morning he's walking into this arena, uh, back in, in it, back in the time of year that this probably was, it was in the spring, when the leaves first come out on the fig trees, uh, not only was it the wrong time of year, because it's really odd that Jesus would curse a tree at the wrong time of year because it didn't have fruit, uh, but actually at this time of year, as soon as the leaves come out on a fig tree, there are these tiny little nuts that come out just before the fruit uh, starts to get pollinated. And poor people which tells us a little bit about the type of background Jesus had, poor people would know that they could go to those fig trees and if they, if they just look among the leaves, they could find these little nuts and eat them. They, they're described as being like almonds. And so that's probably what Jesus was looking for. But there were trees that if they didn't have these little nuts, then uh, the figs would not be produced later in the year when the harvest actually came. And so when Jesus comes to this tree, he's hungry, he's looking for some fruit, uh, these little nuts, and he looks and he finds nothing but leaves. And so he knows that this tree will never produce fruit. And then he walks in and fixes the situation with the, with the uh, chief priests in the temple, at least as far as the, the money changers and the, the, the people selling of animals in the temple. So not only do we get frustrated when we ourselves have difficulty bearing fruit, if our hearts are not able to be used, if our hearts don't have anything but leaves like these fig trees, then I think God gets frustrated with us. When we get frustrated, what do we do? We justify. We say things like, well, the church down the road has... You know, a young preacher has, uh, they've got all the, the young families in town. The church down the road has this. The church down the road has that. Um, uh, we start to complain a little bit, and we say, well, maybe we, we have to be different and this, that, and the other. Or, or maybe we blame. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's the pastor's fault that our church itself doesn't have a lot of fruit. But I think the scary thing is that even with all that being said, and please hear me say this as gentle as possible, we reach a point where we stop caring. That's tough. 
what will we do if God comes along and doesn't find the possibility of fruit among us? I don't think it's hopeless. It's not. I, I think it's possible for, for any church, and, and I'm, not, I'm not targeting our church. Please hear me say that. There are many, many, many churches uh, in our area, in the United States, in Europe, where they have the same thing happening. There's a concern for fruit. But I think there is hope. I don't think that God has cast the curse to wither us yet. I think that the Holy Spirit is here among us, and Jesus, uh, I think, gives us good words on how uh, we can hold on to this hope and, be, and look forward to bearing fruit in the future. In Matthew 28, uh, Jesus gives us the Great Commission. It says in verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. We see within this, I believe, an outline that will allow us to realign. Any church can look to this and see the beginnings of ideas of, of a vision and a mission for reaching others for Christ, to be fruitful again. And the first is to trust in the thing that he said first, and that is his authority. We must trust uh, in the authority of Jesus, and part of that trust is obedience Abraham was willing to be obedient. The chief priests were not. And so if we are willing to trust, we're willing to be obedient, that means we're willing to change individually and uh, corporately to be something that God can use to live out the trust that we have in Jesus. And this is marked, I believe, by fasting and praying. And the next thing that Jesus says here is that we must make disciples, teaching them to be obedient to all the commands that Jesus gave and to baptize them, which is the work of conversion. It is the mark of the covenant with God. And then as we're making disciples, we must continuously Jesus said he would be with us until the end of the age. We must continuously look for the presence of Jesus at work among us. Expect God to show up. How many people expect God to show up? I do. I look at each and every one of you and I see, looking back at me, uh, this beautiful gift that God has created, not just to be in the church, but to be in the world. The Holy Spirit resides in you if you have said yes to Jesus as Lord. Jesus is here among us. We bring him with us when we walk through those doors. And we take him with us when we go back out. Expect God to show up among us. Today, I know it's really easy to focus on our frustrations whenever fruit does not seem to have been born, not only in our individual lives, but in the life of the church. But God can change our frustration into fulfillment. Just like Abraham, he was able to use Abraham uh, to bring forth the people that we call the Jews today. They're, they're, they're innumerable. The blessing has been answered. And God has given that same promise to his church. You just have to be willing to be obedient, to trust, to go out and do what he has asked us to do. And so today, I'm going to ask you all, if you would, to bow your heads with me.
And if you would, I'm going to just invite all of you to, to raise your hands towards heaven. Actually, I'm going to change something. If you would, I'd like to invite you to stand. Uh, and if any of you would like to, to come here and join me up at the front, I'll just invite you all up together with me. Uh, I'm going to turn around and uh, I'm going to ask you, if you would, just put your hands on my shoulders and on each other's shoulders. And let's I'll just ask you to gather around as we stand here at the altar together. we are yours. We ask, Lord, that you would give our hearts a burden for your kingdom, that you would create a burning passion and desire for the newness of life as you breathe into us, that you would give us, Lord, the power and the strength and the courage to be obedient to your calling. And Lord, help us to take our frustration as a sign. That no matter where it comes from, that you are willing to bring life from that which is dead. You are the God who specializes in resurrection. So Lord, help us to breathe your breath. Help us to have your blood run through our veins. Let our flesh be your flesh. We ask, Lord, for your power and your presence. Turn our hearts and let this be according to your will and your plan for our lives. We ask this Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.